hello everyone. Uh, I am Adithya. I'm currently a software at Princeton uh, running Envision this year. Uh, in collaboration with Policy Punchline, uh, we've been having hour-long conversations with people across a wide variety of fields and disciplines to talk to them about how they think the future is going to affect both their discipline and the world, uh, and the world at large. Today, we are so lucky to be with Dr. Tiffany Vora. Uh, she's an educator, researcher, and entrepreneur who's currently a chair of medicine and digital biology at Singularity. Uh, she does a huge amount of work uh, in science communication as well as advising startup founders and uh, also in the scientific writing space. Uh, prior to her current work, uh, she studied uh, mobile chemistry first at NYU and then getting her PhD at our very own Princeton, in fact. Uh, so to get started, uh, I know we were talking about this a little bit before the interview. Uh, the virtual environment must have changed science communication immensely. How do you balance, uh, you know, not being in the face physically while still trying to form that personal connection with people? So there's so much that has changed uh, due to the COVID pandemic over the last year and a half. One of the things that's really changed about science communication, I think, is, is just the pace of how quickly things are changing. So as scientists, we know that science can move kind of slowly. And, and, that, and that's sort of the point, right? We, we know that something we know today isn't necessarily what we're going to know tomorrow and what it's going to look like in a year or five years or 10 years. It, it all changes. And science communication was in the past largely in sync with that timeline. But then during the pandemic, everything started happening faster. We started gathering information faster. We started disseminating it much faster, which meant that for science communicators or science translators like me, it meant that the thing that I told you the science told us yesterday isn't the thing it's telling us today. And so there are these interesting meta nuances that happen where I want you to understand not only what the science tells us today, but why it's different from yesterday and how do we as scientists view that, right? Thinking about uncertainty as a scientist is something completely different than how non-scientists think about uncertainty. So there are all these, it's like an onion, there's all these layers that we ended up having to peel back kind of over and over and over. And we're still doing that so that people really get a sense of what it means. Where do we get these scientific results coming from? How do we get them? Who are the people that are actually underneath all of that science? Because at the end of the day, I think trust has been a really important commodity in the last year. And I've spent the last five years telling people as a communicator that trust is going to be the world's most valuable commodity. And I think we really saw that in the last year, year and a half, where now as we're moving into the vaccination phase of fighting this pandemic, it all comes down to what you know and who you trust. So I think that's probably the biggest thing that's changed. You and I also talked a lot uh, before this interview about just how the nuts and bolts of science communication has changed. So I love being in a room with people. I love being with an audience. I love being with students. I love using our hands. I love actually getting to see the biology as it's happening. And that's something that has changed a lot over the last year. So I use more digital models now. I use more graphical elements when I'm communicating science. When I'm trying to get audience feedback, I can't just look at people's faces anymore. I have to have another way to gather feedback. So I've been piloting a bunch of really low touch ways to get people to give feedback in real time so that I have a sense of what's landing, what's not landing. Am I using too much jargon? Is this audience actually way ahead of me and I can go faster, or I can go more in depth. All of those normal physical cues I lost over the last year. And now that we're moving back into whatever normal is going to look like, I'm getting some of those cues back but I actually don't want to throw away all the learning I've done in the last year about how to communicate with folks digitally around the world, across time zones, synchronously, asynchronously. There's just been so much learning in the last year and a half that I think there's even more we can be doing. And I wanted to dig into the comment about trust a little bit because science communication has always been a bit multi-headed because it has so many different goals, especially in biology where getting people to trust vaccines, to trust medicine is, is a critically important role. It feels like science communication is trying to do three, four things at once. You need to help people understand specific issues like COVID-19 and vaccines. You want them to understand broad precepts like genotyping, 
And then you wanted to trust the process. So how do you balance those three goals that seem like they would often conflict where getting big picture ideas across, but then without confusing the weeds and then also making sure that at the end of the day, they trust the process. And even though there's uncertainty, they trust the officials and they trust uh, the leaders. It seems like balancing that would be almost impossible. So how do you prioritize or is there a way to get around this issue? So I think you've really put your finger on the pulse of where the issue is here. Because if you have folks who are really super duper technically proficient, the scientists or the technologists or the engineers who work on this, they haven't necessarily been taught how to be effective communicators. Uh, and the reverse is true as well. Folks who are taught, trained as journalists, trained as marketers, trained as communicators, don't necessarily have the biology or the technical or the medical chops to first of all, have a bullshit alarm, which is super important if you're a science communicator, but then get it right when we simplify things. So what I'm finding interesting is that there's more of a push now to see overlap between those two things. And since I was, a trained, I was trained as a scientist, let me speak from that point of view. So as I was finishing up my PhD at Princeton, many years ago, uh, I actually was accepted by the New York Times science writing program, um, which was a, a kind of a boot camp where we went to Santa Fe for a week and worked with these great, great science journalists from the New York Times about formulating stories. How do you tell these stories? And the thing that was odd to me when I got there was of the 50 people in the program, 48 of them were journalists trying to write about science. There was only one other woman there who was a neuroscientist who was trying to learn to communicate science to outside the scientific community like I was. So that struck me as strange at the beginning. And I was having to learn, relearn all of my instincts for how I talk about science because I was trained to be a conservative scientist and to only say what I know and to say exactly what I know and to always be hedging everything. What is fact? What is interpretation? Um, and when you're telling a science story to a non-scientist audience, you're actually using a different set of skills. And one thing that I'm seeing more and more often is I'm seeing more training being available for scientists and people who are early in their science career. So for example, the Alan Alda Center for Science Communication puts on these great workshops. I put on a series of workshops for folks to learn how to tell their stories. Um, and now we're seeing more and more scientists actually engaging in the public sphere, engaging on Twitter, engaging on LinkedIn, going in front of cameras, giving interviews. I mean, it's easy when you're a scientist to see all of that as a distraction, right? It, it takes you out of the lab. It takes you out of the hospital. You're not doing your research if you're talking about your research. But I think we're seeing more and more people understanding that this is really part of the job. Talking about what we do as scientists is not separate from doing science. It's fundamentally part of it. And I find that really exciting. So teasing apart what you said all the levels that we have to talk about in science communication, it's not magic. It's a science itself. And just like any skill, the more you use your muscle, the stronger it gets and the better able you are to communicate science. So yeah, to, to keep on going about like how the scientific community can you know, start to do its own communication assumption. So I am by training a computer scientist and I think computer science has done a far worse job than the natural sciences biology, especially of trying to explain itself where, like you said, research in computer science, uh, you know, talking about your research in public doesn't get you grant money, doesn't get you tenure, doesn't get you the SRI position at Google. Uh, and it's ended up leading to this weird situation where the scientists don't talk about the research. The engineers using the research are too busy doing their engineering, which has meant that the, the job of communication has largely ended up being taken up by hype people and certain people who are uh, you know, not of the space and have spread a huge amount of misconceptions. And I know that BIOS and sometimes had a similar problem where obviously like the anti-vax movement and people doing uh, their own research but ending up misinformed. Uh, how do you respond to the people who are already there, who've been trying to communicate or not, who've been communicating some ideas, possibly wrong ones, and you know, taking them out of the conversation in a gentle way? So there's a lot of what you just said to unpack there. So first of all, there's the issue of misaligned incentives, right? The fact that the tenure system, the grant system doesn't explicitly reward 
doing a good job talking about your science with the, the public, I think is a fundamental problem. We're starting to see some shifts in there. And I'm hopeful that another COVID bump will come because we saw what happens when you have these bad incentives. There's also, if you want to talk about rhetoric, the way we are trained to speak to other scientists fundamentally elides the human element of what we're doing. We don't want to seem emotional. We want to seem logical and quantitative and, 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 and evidence-based. And that is both an interesting cultural bias because we're kidding ourselves if we think we're coming to these conversations without emotions. That's a whole other conversation we can have. But I think it also means that it makes us harder to connect with with folks who weren't raised in that culture. So what we've seen, as you said, is folks stepping into that breach, folks who are good at telling a story, folks who are good at finding that human connection. And what happens is their signal gets boosted above the noise. And so there have been some really interesting and, in my opinion, highly alarming studies that have come out recently. There was a, a fantastic one that I've written about several times uh, in some of my work where they were looking at Facebook pages and doing a graph theory analysis of where are, where are the vaccination conversations happening? Where are those nodes? How are those nodes connected? Are they close to the uh, edge of the network? Are they more central to the network? And how are those linkages changing over time for both the, the pro-vax and the anti-vax communities? Now, I actually don't like that language because I, I worry that that language automatically sets us up for a battlefield mentality, that anti-vaxxers are the enemy or pro-vaxxers are the enemy. And we all have the same goal fundamentally, which is for our families to be safe. And when we enter that battlefield mentality, we can end up um, we can end up shutting down conversation instead of fostering it. And that makes me really nervous. And this particular study that I'm telling you about predicts that by the year 2030, at latest, um, anti-vax sentiment will outweigh pro-vax sentiment on Facebook, and that's really really alarming because even though, like I said, we all have the same goal in mind a lot of that messaging is either just false, empirically false, the, the data are wrong, or they're taking things and um, twisting them in a way that speaks to the emotions of the audience, lets you get that real great connection, but doesn't actually reflect the state of the science or the larger view, right? I can give you an example. I have a colleague um, who is, uh, is an anti-vaxxer, because his child sustained a severe neurological injury following the vaccination. And he has extrapolated that personal experience to uh, the pharmaceutical industry is perpetrating a vast scam on the American public and blah, 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 right? And so there's a long line between my child was hurt and the whole industry is a scam that doesn't care about people's health. And trying to be able to intervene way before you get to that extrapolation point is something that we haven't been very good at as scientists and as science communicators. And so while I agree that there are some important things that are going on, you know, social media in particular have been trying things out, shutting down anti-vaxxer accounts, shutting down bots that spread this kind of misinformation or disinformation, um, putting those warning labels on things. I think those are all really great um, initiatives that need to be looked at as experiments to see if they actually work. But at the end of the day, for me, and I guess maybe this is hippie California Tiffany talking, if you make the positive messaging out there, the reliable messaging, you're building trust, you're maintaining trust, you're being trustworthy, that's how you build a tribe. That's where when people are hesitant and are looking for information, that's when you can get through to them, make the connection and get them to be doing the type of more science, pro-science thinking that we would prefer rather than having them you know, fall victim, again, is, is very um, battlefield mentality, but fall victim to messaging that is meant to grab onto their emotions. Yeah, and I know this sort of ties into the prior conversation we're having about how science has a lot of inherent uncertainty uh, and Presenting that uncertainty is challenging because there's been a lot of studies to show that people often really, really want 
authority to give them a clear answer. And if nothing else, a lot of the misinformation out there is providing a clear answer that's easy to understand and might align with certain prior beliefs that you have. So what is the way to try and communicate the inherent uncertainty of all scientific endeavor while not losing the, uh, the lead and, and, letting, and letting people think that science is fully unsure and doesn't know anything and that things haven't improved or we don't know uh, how, to, how to fix this problem? So I think there are both top down and bottom up approaches. There are short term approaches and there are long term approaches, because, again, you've put your finger right on what is really the big issue. So from the bottom up, I think it's important um, to get people to be doing more critical thinking from a very young age. Now, again, I'm biased because I'm a scientist. But, you know, when I was a professor at the American University in Cairo, I was um, one of the, the faculty members responsible for the scientific thinking program that every first year undergraduate was required to take. In fact, every undergraduate was required to take. It was supposed to happen in the first year. And I remember thinking, why are we waiting until university to start teaching people to think critically about the information that they're being given? Now, fast forward, here I am in California, I have a nine-year-old son, and my, my husband, who is also a scientist, when we, he and I talk with our son a lot about, does this information make sense? How do you know? Do you trust this? If you are suspicious, how do you go and you find out what's the right answer or you get a different perspective? And there are lots of initiatives out there that are trying to get, um, you know, what journalists call fact checking, make that more prevalent in everyday life. So for example, there's some free curricula available through Stanford University that is meant to be getting um, teenagers and older to be thinking critically, particularly in an area where digital literacy is so important. And so I like the idea of hitting people as they're young, as they're in the public school system, getting them to think more critically. And that'll help with the younger generations. Now, you know, what do we do for older folks, including for our elderly generations, who again, come from a background, come from a history where if you read it in a newspaper, somebody somewhere was betting it, right? It had to be true. And now we're in the area of era of TikTok and Facebook. And like anybody can say anything they want because everybody's got a microphone. And so there's a lot of concern as well about older generations not having digital literacy, not having that scientific literacy, not having that bullshit alarm to know when does something look fishy. And we also know that there are certain communities, certain historically marginalized communities that are facing the same issues. And again, I think it all comes down to trust. So it's about being trustworthy as a communicator, establishing trust and actively working to maintain that trust. It means our institutions have to do that as well. You know, in the United States, the biomedical community is still laboring under the um, deep distrust that things like the Tuskegee um, incident have sown in minority populations where this awful thing happened within living memory. And we're still trying to reestablish a sense of trust for these, especially think about COVID now, where we've got all of these vaccines that are out there under EUA, emergency use authorization, that haven't gone through the complete clinical trial process yet because we're doing it right now, right? And now, just to be clear, I got my vaccines the second they were um, available to me, and the second my son qualifies, he will have a needle in his arm. That is how strongly I believe in this process. But when I talk to people about vaccinations for COVID, I talk about me, I talk about my family, I talk about why I'm so excited about this, I talk about why I trust this, not just the data, the facts and the figures, but I try to speak from a, here's how I deal with this uncertainty, here's what worries me, here's what I'm watching for, here's what I keep my eyes open for. So again, I think as scientists, as doctors, as policymakers, if we can reveal the way we think, the way we're trained to think, the way we deal with uncertainty, I think that can really position people to trust us because I'm not just up there talking about the party line. I'm sharing the things that I'm concerned about 
and what I'm doing to watch out for that. So I think that uncertainty metric is a really important one because uncertainty and trust are kind of anti-correlated. You mentioned authority. I think we're also moving generationally towards a less um, authority valuing average citizen, whatever that means. Um, And so getting a sense of how do we deal with that shift? How do we deal with generations that are more authority minded versus generations that are less authority minded or populations that are more or less authority minded? And the good news is we have tools to do that, but it means we can't just make assumptions about the people we're talking to. We have to actually understand our audience before we can effectively communicate with them. And that's a hell of a lot of work, but it's really important work. Yeah, and I wanted to, for, for K-12 education specifically, I know you've also done work uh, trying to draw more women and people of color uh, into science. And I believe your work believes that that work has to get done as young as possible because once you're in university, it's too late. Uh, so I was wondering uh, what your thoughts were on like what the public education system can do not only to get people generally more, more interested in the scientific method and understanding the uncertainty, but for historically marginalized communities in particular. Yeah, my gosh, it's so important, like you said. And again, going back to this idea of trust, you're more likely to trust someone who looks like you, who sounds like you, who comes from your community. And that's just one reason to have more women, more people of color, more people from all over the world involved in these conversations, because that is making the message land a bit better. It's also, we know that um, different perspectives, different education, different life experiences all lead to this enhancement of creativity. So you asked me, what about K to 12? And here's my experience and the thing that drives me kind of crazy. From my point of view, all kids are scientists. All kids are engineers. They ask questions until you think you're gonna lose your mind. They build things. They break things, they build them again. And there's something about our traditional education system that beats that out of children, that gets rid of that natural spark of curiosity, that why and that how can I, and turns people into uh, worker bees or teaches them not to like science or engineering. And that really, really bothers me. So one of the things um, that I help uh, schools in my area and and some other schools around the world do is, what can you do with that natural enthusiasm to turn it into a learning moment, but still keep it fun? Now, I live in Silicon Valley, so we're a very affluent area, and there's tons of opportunities for kids to be doing this, right? So trivial example, Lego Mindstorms, right? You've got a kit that takes a toy that is being aggressively marketed around the world. And um, sometime my friend, you and I will have a beer. We'll talk about Lego because boy, do I have opinions about that as a mother, but as a scientist and a science educator, if I can get my kid to be learning robotics and learning a bit of coding while he's playing Lego, that's fantastic. Uh, Another thing is trying to keep kids, um, solution-minded and and have grit. So it's so easy for a kid to come to you and to say, I I can't make it work. And you want the kid to, you know, leave you alone because you're busy, you're working, you're doing whatever it is. So you just solve the problem and then the kid goes on their way. But by doing that, we're not teaching them to assess a problem, to experiment, to fail, and then to try again. So let me give you a funny, funny story example. My son is, you know, he's short. And uh, for a long time, he couldn't open the fence. He couldn't get the latch to the fence to open. And I kept saying to him, solve the problem, solve the problem, solve the problem. So one day I went to take the garbage out uh, next to my house and I couldn't get the fence to open. And I was so annoyed and I looked and there was a stick that had been jammed into the latch of the fence. And of course I knew it was my kid and I was absolutely furious. And before I started yelling though, I actually looked at what he had done and he had jury rigged a stick and a washer and a piece of string to enable him to hit the latch and then keep it latched open so that he could come in and out of the fence. And so even though I was annoyed because now I couldn't use the fence, 
he had done exactly what I had told him to do. He had solved the problem with the resources that he had at hand. And if you're a little boy, you always have a stick, like always. So I, I ended up being really proud of him and telling him like, okay, great. Like this is, this is what you need to be doing. Another time I caught him setting up a ladder to go up on a roof because he had thrown a ball up on the roof and he knew I was going to tell him to just solve the problem. And I was like, wait, 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 <laughs> let's talk about other ways we could get the ball up off the roof. And he was like, oh, the drone. I was like, yes, get the drone and knock the ball off the roof. Like, don't just set up a ladder. So getting kids to see problems as challenges that fundamentally they can solve to me, that's a scientist mindset. To me, that's an engineering mindset, but it really is just a person mindset. Solve your own problems, figure it out. And again, that this being able to fail, this is something I think also really needs to be taught in schools. In school, you want the right answer, but I'm not actually interested in you getting the right answer. I'm interested in how you get to an answer and figure out whether that answer is right. And that's an entirely different set of skills that I think we're not very good at teaching our kids. So more experimentation, more hands-on, more letting kids fail, making a science experiment not just be about following directions, the way building a Lego kit is just following directions, like giving them more freedom to fail and then to troubleshoot and go on to the next step. That I think is really important. And for me, that's the crux of being a scientist or being an engineer. So you teach kids at the beginning how to do that, how to value failure. You put people in front of them who look like them and who do that for a daily business. And then you have to also do things within the pipeline to retain people in the pipeline. So for example, you know, at the undergraduate level, about 50% or even more than 50% of undergraduates going after a biology degree are female. And yet you look at your professors and how many of them are female. And so making sure at every step in the pipeline, we are doing what it takes to keep women, to keep people from historically marginalized communities, to keep them in the pipeline is really, really important. And there's been a lot of work in this area over the last you know, 10, 20 years, but some of it is cultural as well, right? Like it's easy to say, you have a mandatory 10-year extension clock for women because if you have a baby when you're a junior professor, that really makes it hard to get work done. But then what they found when these first initiatives were put out were that women were refusing to take the 10-year clock extension because their male colleagues weren't doing it. So it makes you look weak. It makes you look like you need extra help. So then the next step was, okay, mandatory 10-year extension clock for everyone. Okay, well, that does the gender differential, but now you've got young professors who have less job security for longer. And the more children they have, the longer that period of job insecurity goes on. So again, how are we dealing with these unintended consequences? How are we making sure these steps um, at every step of the pipeline are doing whatever they can to keep people in the pipeline? And if folks decide to leave, let's say the academic pipeline, there's a whole huge world out there. How do we keep connected? How do we broaden our networks? How do we broaden our communities? So that even though like someone like me who stepped off the academic tenure track pipeline, I'm still engaged in the community. I'm still able to contribute and I'm still able to mentor particularly women, particularly people of color, particularly people who are early in their careers and have it make a difference. So, I mean, listen, man, everybody wins when everybody wins. That's like the simplest thing I, I can think of, but it requires institutional change. It requires cultural change. It requires mindset change. And all of those things are difficult, but not unsolvable. Now, on the exploration-based learning front, well, I think I agree with you almost entirely. I just wanted to play devil's advocate briefly that the current education system, the argument made for it is that everyone needs this common, well-established base of knowledge that you should know, you know, what is an orbital in chemistry? What is a gene? What is, you know, a transcriptase uh, protein cluster? Uh, and uh, with the exploration-based approach, it's much, much harder, uh, one, to ensure that, that common base exists because everyone's on their own pace, everyone's off doing whatever interests them. And uh, while there's possibly too much of a focus on assessment in the modern education system, some amount of assessment to find out, did we meet learning objectives? 
uh, you know, what classes you take in the future is probably necessary. And it's incredibly hard to assess exploration-based learning if you don't have like six person classes with one professor who can dedicate all their time to this. So how do you not lose the common base and not lose the accessibility while still introducing these exploration-based ideas? I, I think the answer has to be, it has to be a yes and. So the good news is in terms of straight up knowledge acquisition, the explosion of digital materials is wholly helpful for that, right? Khan Academy, YouTube videos, TED, like you pick an educational system that you like. If I can have my son consuming um, on, you know, his screen time is learning about chemistry orbitals, for example, like that's great. That means then the time that he's spending in the classroom with other humans, including his teachers, but also including fellow students, is fundamentally different. We're flipping the purpose of the classroom. The classroom then is not about knowledge acquisition. The physical classroom comes about skills practicing and skills building, which we can call experiential learning. There's a whole bunch of other things there. And I think as we look forward into the future of education at the university level and then moving back into K through 12, I think even coming out of this COVID bump, we're going to be seeing more and more hybrid approaches where the knowledge acquisition part can have some sort of digital component. You can have, you know, AI tutors, all of these things that actually get you through that knowledge acquisition. But at the end of the day, knowing those chemistry orbitals is only going to help you so much. I mean, even think about actually think about chemistry is a perfect example. You don't actually have to have a laboratory to do chemistry. You can do it in a kitchen. So if you were to have food based experiments that teach you all these things about these various um, chemical principles, that would work, right? Like colligative properties, boiling water, salt, no salt, putting oil in water. And my kid gets, again, gets this all the time in my house because I was originally trained as a chemist. We care a lot about food in our house. So there's a lot of, oh, look what's happening on the stove right now. Or what happens if you add this to this? No, you try it. And then again, as biologists, so, and our next door neighbor, actually they hunt. So we spent time with dead animals. Oh, look, here's the heart. Here's the kidney. Here's the lung. Here's how it works. No, you can touch it. So there's ways to integrate experiential learning, science, engineering, medicine, even at home, not requiring a specialized laboratory to do. And frankly, I don't think we've explored that space enough. There is quite a bit of very low cost, very low equipment overhead, and frankly, low training required to get quite a bit of understanding and experience out of doing these things. And then for the straight up learning, um, straight up knowledge acquisition, I love um, you know, the idea of doing it digitally, of using virtual reality and augmented reality for these things. And again, you'll say, oh, well, virtual reality is expensive. A Google Cardboard costs $5 and it's good enough. And there are, uh, I, I have one here somewhere. I'm not entirely sure where it is, but like I have a, a fold scope, which is an origami microscope that costs $1. Is it the best microscope I've ever used? No, but I can put it in my pocket and my kid can use it and I'm not afraid of it breaking. We have $20 digital telescopes that you can get online uh, right now from Amazon that you either plug into your phone or plug into your laptop. Again, not the greatest microscope, but it's good enough. So I just think there's so much more good enough space that we have only begun to explore by combining digital and in-person learning. Yeah, and I guess like part of the thing is that uh, at least if parents have time that like reframing some of play as scientific, you know, allows you to still be educated, but not to lose time and have children be 12 hours a day in school. Right. Uh, but yeah. So yeah, I guess it then just comes down to the issue of like parental time. Uh, Cause I know that we, we talk about the, in, in developmental psychology, the, what is it? A million words by age three is, is the gap between, you know, more affluent parents with time to do these sort of activities and less affluent ones who have to be working more jobs. Yeah. And so again, just making the children of affluent parents even better and widening that achievement gap, that's not the goal. So again, how are we doing this in a way that is not placing an undue burden on parents? And again, I think technology is the answer, right? Anything we can do that is going to be cheap, accessible, and frankly, does not require that much work from parents, 
you are going to get uptake for. That's why I, I particularly like gamification, for example, right? Um, a couple of years ago, and it's, it's ironic now, but uh, there's this board game called Plague Inc., which came out several years ago. It's a great game. Um, I, we play the board game version, not the app in our house because we're old fashioned like that. Um, but what was interesting was when the COVID pandemic started, the company realized like hmm, having a game where you're the plague, you're the virus, you're the bacterium trying to take over the world. Like that's got a bit of a, a tin ear right now. So let's flip it around. So instead the new version of the game, you're the WHO you're the CDC, and you are working on ways, strategies to mitigate the spread. And so that has things like hand washing and vaccination and social distancing and all these things. And so while you're playing the game, you're actually learning about how these things work. And the company pivoted, they released the new version. Um, and it's been used by the CDC. It's been used by the WHO. It's been used in university classes and in elementary school classes as well getting kids to see in a fun way and actually learn about epidemiology, viral biology, uh, bacterial biology. There's a lot of stuff that's hidden in there um, that I think we can be doing, especially with gamification. So the parent wins because their child is being entertained. The kid wins because they're actually getting some sort of educational experience. That's fun. So it doesn't cost them anything. Um, we've also had, uh, so another example, my son, um, wanted to play Minecraft several years ago. And my husband said, you want to learn, you want to play Minecraft. That's fine. You're going to learn to code in Python. So he bought him a coding Python in Minecraft book. And our kid didn't know that there was a GUI that he could be using. Like he thought he had to do this coding. So, you know, it's kind of like evil parenting, but our kid has got a head start on coding. Now, is he a great coder? No, not really. But he's not that much worse than I am, which is alarming for a lot of reasons. And we gave him a problem to solve that was something he wanted to do anyway. So I am just looking for more and more examples of this. There are mail home kits that you get delivered, uh, you get delivered to your home for your kid to build something once a month. And there are no extra tools required. Everything you need is in the box. That's great. You've got Goldie Blocks, right? The, the engineering and building stuff that is gender neutral or more um, aligned for young girls to be using. Um, so I, I just, I like all of that. And I really like too that there's, I think there's a cultural shift going on. You know, when I, when I was little, a girl knowing the right answer was shameful. And there were lots of times where I wouldn't talk in class because I knew people were going to make fun. The boys were going to make fun of me because I was the girl who knew the answer. And I see a lot less of that now, not zero, but a lot less anti-intellectualism and a lot less anti-female anti-intellectualism than I used to. And I feel really good about that. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I think... I've always been, so I'm involved in, I don't know if you're familiar with Splash. Uh, it's an organization that was uh, founded at MIT and I think has chapters at Yale, Stanford, Princeton, and a few other places. You might be familiar with the Stanford chapter being from uh, around there. And we are always have a really, really hard time striking the balance between like fun and intensive learning can often be slightly at odds with one another. And we're also uh, targeting an older audience. But we found that if you, you know, have a three-hour class on the intricacies of lambda calculus, no one shows up. Or the people who show up are the ones who are already interested and right. probably didn't need your help that much anyways. Uh, and then if you teach a class that's like, you know, make a, uh, make a kite with Arduino, then a lot of people show up and maybe you didn't deliver that much actual educational content. So like striking that middle zone has been... Uh, very, very hard, but we've come to the conclusion that the goal shouldn't be in the hour that we have to actually teach things, but to get them to the place where they can teach themselves. So like a really successful, uh, a really successful uh, project that happened at MIT Splash that I helped with was the Tesla coil class. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with this at all. I guess you're on the other coast, but <laughs> it's a, a six-hour class uh, where students walk out with a working Tesla coil. Uh, so we start uh, for the first 30 minutes or so 
essentially just playing with Tesla coils and getting them to believe that this is a thing that you want. Uh, and this is the thing that you want to be able to build. And then we spend, after having motivated them with this, like two and a half hours getting into ENM and circuits and all the things you need to know to be able to, one, actually build one, and two, not electrocute yourselves by accident. Right. Uh, and pain is also, we found, a very powerful motivator. Uh, mm -hmm. We're working with a low enough voltage that no one's actually going to get that hurt, but stings still suck, still suck a lot. So people tend to get better very, very quickly at the soldering once they realize that messing it up leads to a shock. Uh, and then after that, they go home, one with something that they've built, they can be proud of, they can keep it on their bedstand, and they've learned enough circuits and they've learned enough physics. And we make sure to leave a ton of resources at the end that if they want, they're now empowered to go and do their own thing. That's brilliant. I love it. Yeah. My kid soldered his thumb once. And that was it. Didn't do it again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I think you're right. And I think that that pride in having been a maker is a really strong motivator. That's addictive, right? And um, again, I, I mentioned these kits that my son gets in the mail every month. You know, he's made a bank, he's made a, uh, a flashlight, he's made a pinball machine, which is funny because I don't know that he'd ever seen a pinball machine before. So that was a disconnect, but he built that. And, you know, they're kind of scattered all over our house and he brings them out to show people when, when they come over. And that's great. That's exactly what we want. And you're sneaking in, like you said, you're sneaking in the robotics, you're sneaking in the, the electronics, um, you're sneaking this stuff in and getting people hooked. And then the question is, do they have the resources to follow up on it afterwards? And as long as the answer to that is yes, I agree. You've done your job by igniting the curiosity and giving that support in the early stage. And then they grow their wings and they fly off into the world. And, and that's the idea. Completely agree. Yeah. One of the things we've actually been really hopeful about is as 3D printers get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and get more distributed. Because uh, the problem with the Tesla coil is there's no way that we're letting people touch soldering irons or batteries or stuff if there aren't a ton of like educated undergrads and grad students very carefully watching over what's happening. But with 3D printing, CADing is something you can totally tutor remotely. And there's a huge amount of like, you know, math and modeling and color theory involved there. Uh, and even programming it for higher level CAD design. And then as long as there's a 3D printer within like 15 miles of their house, they can go and they can print it and then it can, it can be there for them. Uh, so it allows us to, again, like you're talking about, have it be low cost and distributed. Uh, yeah, and, and CAD as well, right? You've got millions and millions of American kids who are playing Minecraft. It's not that far of a jump from the Minecraft mentality to the CAD mentality. Um, and yeah, I mean, like you said, the, the 3D printer accessibility is important. We actually have one in our house. Um, and the, the funny thing is, again, it's mindset. So the first thing my son wanted to do was print Legos. And I was like, we do not need any more Legos in this house. Like, this is not what a 3D printer for is not for printing Legos. Um, and so uh, a few months ago, I am going to share a little shameful thing with you. I am locked in an existential struggle with the squirrels in my yard. We are battling over my bird feeders, battling over my plants. And um, we have lost I, the battle in this house. They, they, yes. The attic is theirs now. Yes. it's. I, I, I haven't given up yet, but they're winning. They, they, they're frequently winning. And one day when I thought I was going to lose my mind over the squirrels, I um, went on to, I think, Thingiverse, and I found a CAD file for a squirrel baffle. And I went to my husband and I said, either you 3D print this squirrel baffle for me, or I'm hiring the kid next door to start shooting the squirrels. Like, those are our choices. And so he did it. He, he 3D printed for me the anti-squirrel device. We assembled it. We put it outside. I took all of these pictures of like the squirrel looking miserable and the squirrel sitting below it. And, you know, and still, I just checked it yesterday. It's still there and it's still repelling squirrels. And I feel like that is the one useful thing we've used our 3D printer for. Um, but because I was enraged, I wasn't in a designer's mindset. So I wasn't going to try to design my own. I just went again, like you're saying, like distributed, centralized, there's these databases out there where people are just putting this stuff out there. It took me 45 seconds to find a, a plan that I wanted to try and we were able to do it quickly. Again, fighting squirrels, maybe not the best use of this technology, but anything again, that helps you rapidly prototype. So 3D printers are amazing for that. That gets you to see how the digital world and the physical world can really interact. 
and that make you believe that you can solve a problem without somebody else solving it for you, that's fantastic. And we have, I mean, I live, again, I live in Silicon Valley, so we have these things everywhere, but they're popping up more and more in public libraries where you can rent time on a 3D printer. Schools are doing it uh, and they're getting cheap enough that they can be in elementary schools. My son's school has one. Um, so I think that's really exciting and getting that maker mindset, even if I can't make the whole world into scientists or engineers, just getting that maker mindset, I think is hugely important, especially as we're staring down the face of things like climate change, which are gonna require interventions at every level and creativity at every level from individuals to societies. I, I love the idea of folks being empowered from very early ages to do that. Yeah, and I know that like, yeah, because you're talking about respectable-ish 3D, like, like you were saying, good enough 3D printers are getting into the 150, 125 range, which is totally doable for most school districts. But one thing I wanted to sort of circle back to was with Plague Inc. And then now with, I know a lot of people were 3D printing masks early on in the pandemic. Uh, the pandemic has given a huge boost, it feels like, to public interest in science as it's sort of effective in a very physical way. And in particular, at least from my perspective, for the longest time, the science that had captured the public imagination was cosmology and particle physics. And it feels like it's transitioned a bit now into biology and climate science as those become the pressing problems of the day. How do science communicators sort of hold on to this momentum that once the pandemic goes away, how do you retain interest in, in you know, broader ideas beyond just COVID? Well, we have some time because COVID's not going anywhere for a while, unfortunately. So I think one way to do is to keep coming back to touchstones that uh, you encountered while you were in COVID, right? So the idea of the microscopic world, that there are these things going on that you can't see, right? Now everybody knows at least what a coronavirus looks like. And so if you want to talk about other microscopic things, you can compare it to that, right? This is smaller than a coronavirus. This is bigger than a coronavirus. There are more of them. Um, I'm finding that is a, a nice analogy. Also with the fascination with RNA vaccines and these adenovirus display vaccines, being able to talk about biology as a, a platform, I think has gotten a lot of traction now because the, the public's mind has been primed to at least know that someone somewhere can do these things. So if we can keep drawing these direct lines, I think that will help keep a lot of that going. And I think as well as we pivot from the COVID pandemic to the climate change issue, in my opinion, the, you know, the biology, particularly the biological solutions we have through synthetic biology and agricultural reform and all these things, those are going to be some of the most important and powerful weapons that we have. So if you can, again, draw that line, say, oh, we were able to use this platform technology, the synthetic biology, for example, during COVID. Hey, look, if we just change the parts out, if you just swap the parts out, you might have a climate change solution. You're enabling people to do that transition or that translation learning, which is actually not that easy to do but you're pulling down the barriers to being able to make those translations. And so I want to encourage people always to look for those, um, those touchstones. So I think that we, like you said, we do have a lot of excitement now about medicines, about devices, about knowing how the biology works um, from the COVID pandemic. And if we can keep riding that bump, keep people fascinated. And I think this might be the most important part during COVID, with all this science, with all this medicine, with all this engineering, there were things that individual people had to do. You saw how you personally, your family was connected to these things. And I think if we keep looking for those personal connections, that's how we can keep this momentum going. Yeah. And then I guess like the, the final big picture question I wanted to focus on is that uh, in terms of an end state, I know you've talked about uh, getting to a place where hopefully most people worldwide have what you called a maker, uh, a scientist mindset. But as a part of that, is your goal that most people end up in a science engineering space? Or is the idea that people will take this maker, this maker uh, space and use it 
in their jobs, whether even jobs that are very, very far removed from science and engineering, whether that's, you know, uh, doing office work or, you know, being a policeman or, or whatever else it is. So, I, I, yeah, I, my goal is not to have everyone be a scientist or an engineer. Um, my goal is to have everyone who wants to be a scientist or an engineer not be dropped from the pipeline. So that's one of my goals. But the things that I, in my mind, in Tiffany's magic fantasy world, define the science mindset, I think those things empower people no matter what career you go into. Um, you know, and those things are a humble mindset, a curious mindset an evidence mindset, a willingness to change your mind in the face of evidence mindset. No matter what you're doing, I think those are part, that's part of being a citizen. That's part of, um, it's just part of being light, uh, alive. And for me as well, the idea of being an observer, um, I am a trained observer as a biologist, but that means that I notice beauty around me. I notice the beautiful things. And so I don't want a world without artists, without musicians, without poets, without firefighters, without policemen, without all of the things we need. But I, I think that as a species, as humans, we can be better than we are by adopting some of what I think of as being the scientific mindset. And for me, at the end of the day, that's what it's about. It's about making life better. And I think that this mindset can lead people there. People say, oh, if you're a scientist, you know, if you understand like how everything works, then it makes it less beautiful. And I don't understand that. For me, understanding how something works makes it more beautiful, more awe-inspiring, you know, to look at a glass of orange juice and realize that that came from the sun. That's insane, right? And yeah, if you understand photosynthesis, it's great but you can still know that this stuff happens in the natural world and that we understand how it works and still see the beauty and the magic in it. And that's the world that I want to see. I guess like, you know, a last question I'll have, and this is somewhat selfish because I think computer science has this problem more than biology does, is that uh, how do you turn, I think the public, you know, even after going through the K-12 system has a huge amount of excitement, both for, you know, scientific ideas and the things that the scientific ideas can do. But there's this problem of it often seems to end at the excitement where they're excited about, you know, CRISPR or gene editing or mRNA vaccines, but then the interest doesn't go far enough to go, you know, sit down with the textbook or, or get, into, get into the weeds. So how do you sort of help them get over that gap where they want to ask questions, but getting to the point where they can understand is going to require, you know, several months worth of work. I think we should look at other uh, industries where this works, right? Like I can be totally into baseball and have no interest in being a baseball player, right? But I have a variety of resources open to me, radio shows, video shows, podcasts, all these other things to be learning more about baseball in a way that doesn't feel onerous. What if we could do that with science and engineering? What if you could be a bio fan the way you can be a baseball fan? And the resources are out there. They're not monetized. We don't have these, you know, uh, financial industries behind science fandom the way we do under, uh, you know, sports fandom. But I think, again, there's still some underexplored space in there where we can make that easier. I'm really excited by um, initiatives that try to make science technical writing, but do that translation, we're back to science communication, right? Um, so for example, Ed Young's writing in the Atlantic uh, has been brilliant. I've been a fan of his for many years. You can see one of his books over on my shelf over here. Um, he did a wonderful job of taking the science and not making it dumb, but making it accessible. And that, again, the Atlantic, that's a pretty high level of readership. But I've seen that even trickling down. Did you see that brilliant XKCD comic? that shows how RNA viruses work, uh, sorry, RNA uh, vaccines work using the Star Wars as an analogy. Like that's what I told my kid because my kid understands Star Wars, right? So again, anytime we can find these types of analogies and get people to really see how it applies to them, I think then you're right. There's some, if you think of it like a bell curve, like there's some there's some portion of the population who's going to do the hard work of, of figuring it out because that's just who we are. I'm that kind of person, but we don't need that. 
for life to be better. What we need is, I think, for people to see the wonder and the beauty and how science can make their lives better and how they can do it at some level. And that, I think, will be a really big step forward. Yeah, I mean, yeah, let's hope that the digital explosion will lead to that. I know that we're sort of running up towards the end of our time. So are there any final thoughts we'd like to leave our listeners with? Well, uh, I think all of us are part of this grand community, right? We talk about science communication as if there are people who are scientists and there are people who are not scientists. And it might be that that's the box that you check out on your census form. But I honestly believe that every person is a scientist. Every person looks at the world around them, thinks about what's going on, tries to predict what's going to happen in the future. And I think it's this really um, binding emotion, uh, this appreciation for, for beauty and, and life and all of these things. And I think if we spent more time looking at that, we would see more connections between people instead of divisions among them. And I believe as well that with the technologies that we're moving into, we are only going to see an acceleration of technologies, biotechnologies, computing technologies that are going to make the near future seem like science fiction to us today. And if you have a chance to get on board now, life is gonna be radically different within 20 years, maybe even only 10 years. So get involved, get your kids involved, figure out how to be part of the community of the future because that's happening right now. And it's really important and exciting.